They share 97% of our DNA. They are our closest cousins. But the orangutans on the Indonesian island of Sumatra are under constant threat from fires, deforestation, and the illegal wildlife trade. Now, an Australian zoologist is reintroducing these gentle creatures back into the wild, something many thought impossible. I'm Steve Chow. On this episode of 101 East, we meet the orangutan whisperer. There's a fierce battle raging in the jungles of Indonesia. On the one side, there are those who say they're fighting for the Indonesian people, developing their land to improve their lives. On the other is a man fighting for what he believes are another group of people, also marginalised and no less deserving. It's always wonderful um, to connect with another person, you know. And in my viewpoint, you know, orangutans are one of the most noble persons on the planet today. All his career, Leif Cox has been pushing boundaries. His life has been threatened, his opinions laughed at. But everybody agrees this man has a gift with orangutans and a vision for their future. You have to be a strong character to work in this industry, and he is very strong. But when you see him connect with some of those orangutans, you can tell how emotional he really is. You can see it. Over the last decade, Leif Cox has developed a series of jungle schools for orangutans who have been orphaned, mistreated, or kept illegally as pets. He teaches them to live back in the forest, from preschool to primary school to high school, and then freedom. He's hoping to change how we feel about these great apes and save them from extinction. The question is, can he do it? I'll catch you at the mess. Okay, bye. Well, <laughs> we're finally here. We've flown, we've driven hundreds of kilometers, we've walked a kilometer from there, and now we're out in the middle of nowhere. But that there is the base camp for one of the most revolutionary orangutan projects in the world. I'm about to see what it's all about. Here are the um, night cages. As a jungle school always, the main aim is... The boarding houses of this extraordinary school look far from enticing, but the health and welfare of its students are given every possible protection. Okay, so which one is mm -hmm. which? Cool. Who's who? It is Dora on the right here. Dora? Yep, and Suro on, on the left here. Suro. Okay. Wearing masks to prevent transmission of any disease, Leif and colleague Julius are taking Dora and Sura out to the jungle for today's lesson. Like every orangutan who comes here to jungle school, Dora and Sura are orphans. Come on, Dora. And both were commodities in the illegal pet trade. Dora was found in a Buddhist monastery in North Sumatra. The monks holding her were probably unaware they were doing anything wrong. She was identified, you know, as um, illegally held. What do you mean illegally held? Because it's illegal to hold an orangutan in captivity. You know, they're a protected, critically endangered species. So once location is reported, you, what you normally do in conjunction with the police and the Ministry of Forestry is you, you undertake a, a raid to confiscate the orangutan. Good girl, Dora. Night. Night, night. Good girl. Now rescued, they must learn step by step how to survive in the jungle. So lesson one mm -hmm. is finding food. Mm -hmm. Why do you need to train an orangutan to find food? Um, because their mothers have been killed and it's the mother which pass on the cultural traditions and the knowledge on how to find food in the forest. So we have to replace that. Like humans, orangutan infants are deeply dependent upon their mothers. They are not born knowing how to survive. Every aspect of life in the jungle must be learnt. And just as we learn to walk, 
an orangutan too needs to learn how to climb. And climbing, like walking, will always start with a few stumbles. You know, when they slip and fall in the beginning, you know, often what they'll do is they'll get a little frightened and they'll come back to you, you know, and go, oh, that was scary. And they get the love and the fetch and that closeness from you and, and you reassure them. And, and then they're then ready what to do you, go back and out And what again. do you say to them when they go back out? When we go back out, we normally go night night, which means climb, climb in Indonesian to, to get them off the ground. Because one of the key things we have to teach them straight up is the ground is bad. Because once we are no longer monitoring, they go on the ground, you know, they're tiger fodder. It's critical for the orangutans at this stage of their training to identify the sorts of food they can find in the forest. 120 different sorts of plants, fruits, or in this case, termites, are introduced to the orangutans while still in their cages. They then need to demonstrate they can find all of these foods in the forest before progressing to the next stage of the program. So is this Dora? Yeah, um, Dora's returning now from the forest. Um, we're not quite confident that you know, she can make a night nest and stay safe overnight, so she comes back to the cage each night until she graduates, which should be quite soon, to stage two, where she can stay out all night. Dora, you want some termites? Yeah, there you go. Good girl. The final challenge remaining for Dora at this stage of her training is building a night nest made of leaves and branches. We need them sleeping in the trees above where the tigers are safely all night and that's one of the key elements of moving from stage one to stage two in their training. Are they still learning it? They, they don't look so good at this. No, actually they're, they're, they're getting there, yeah. Cox's childhood was spent in the concrete jungle of Hong Kong, but he always had a fascination with nature. He studied zoology and gained a job here at Perth Zoo in Western Australia, where he eventually took charge of the orangutan exhibit. Yep, most of his life now. Well, I, I, I volunteered because, you know, I thought, well, these are a, a very in interesting animal. And one of the things we found out quickly is, yeah, not only I like orangutans, but um, they like me too. As keeper, Cox started something that would not only change his life, but the lives of orangutans throughout the world. He went in and sat with them in their cages. Well, back when I was trained, I was simply told what to feed them. No one told me that orangutans are, are dangerous and, you know, <laughs> uh, How and could tell you apart. Can they, can they kill you? One of those interesting things is they're seven to ten times stronger than a human being, you know, so they're mentally powerful and the males have huge canines, just like a tiger, and they can do considerable damage um, to people. However, they have never killed a person in recorded history, although we know we've killed probably over a million of them. Cox revolutionised orangutan exhibits, introducing new structures and innovative activities. Then, after 25 years caring for these creatures, he went on record stating that no orangutan should be kept permanently in captivity. He resigned on grounds of conscience. I think zoos can display and educate people with a variety of animals, which do perfectly well in captivity and quite happy. But animals such as orangutans simply can't. Cox committed his life to orangutan conservation, working with other partners to rehabilitate orphaned orangutans and then teaching them how to survive in the wild. Here at the quarantine station we have 45 orangutans that are currently under our care, that are going through different stages of uh, schooling process to return back to the forest. Supervised by Cox's colleague Jess McKelson, the rehabilitation program begins here, at the quarantine and pre-release station in North Sumatra. This is little Puspa, she means flower, and she's one of our latest ones that just came in last week. She's so cute. Puspa oh. came all the way from Kuwait. She, uh, Wait, was she's in Kuwait? Puspa and one of her friends were around the age of two months, and they found her in a suitcase on an economy flight from Indonesia 
with two oxygen cylinders uh, to give them air to breathe. And that's just one example of main, yeah, a lot of animals that get illegally smuggled. Like, how much would you get for mm -hmm. somebody like Puspa on the illegal wildlife trade? Well, it really depends where you are. At the village level, you might get $20 or $50. Um, but by the time you get to some place like Kuwait, you could be ten to $20,000. OK, Yeti, Puspa, <laughs> the doctor. Every new arrival at the quarantine centre must first be tested for a variety of diseases and nursed back to full health before being released with other orangutans at the facility. Okay, can you see your teeth? Up. Mm -hmm. up, up, up. Your teeth look good, Yan? Yeah. yeah. The second incision is uh, growing now. Mm -hmm. Up, 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 go. Yes, how far do you think she is away from graduating to the next stage? Um, it should still be another few months. Once she gets her health check um, fully passed with Yenny, um, then we'll talk about how we introduce her to slightly older animals. Once released from quarantine, Uspa will begin her long journey to freedom here at Jungle Gym. It can be a little tricky starting from scratch, but like these guys here, she won't be facing it alone. What we do is we introduce orangutans in groups that we think there's benefit for each other, you know. So there's orangutans which are very good at nest building, those are very good at foraging for food. And, and so the, I guess, the release party, you know, brings together, you know, a, a range of skills for all of them to learn and survive. The orangutans here are not just given their food. Much of it is hidden in boxes or enclosed in a cage, so they must think more and work hard to find it. So when you look at them now, what kind of feelings are inside you? You know, the best rescue centre in the world is empty. You know, we shouldn't be doing this, you know. My main goal is, when I see these little guys, is say, I want these guys to go back and live you know, long lives, but I don't want to see another orangutan into this process again. I want us to be able to successfully protect the forest and wild populations so this centre will close down. Feeling that little or nothing was being done to enforce wildlife protection laws or fight the illegal pet trade, Cox began to think outside the box. Instead of begging the Indonesian government to stop giving permits to those destroying the forest, Cox and his colleagues began leasing the land themselves. 34,000 hectares in central Sumatra has been transformed from a former logging station into a reserve for endangered animals. The last time this forest saw orangutans was in 1830. Now, as a result of Leif and his colleagues' work, it has a population of almost 200. And one of its newest inhabitants is Penny. Wow, there she is. Yeah. Beautiful. So this is Penny. This is Penny, yeah. Julius is already here. So. Julius. Penny graduated from the first stage of jungle school about two years ago. She no longer returns to her cage each night. Stage two is when they're making a night nest and staying out overnight, but we're monitoring them from dawn to dusk each day. She's talking to you. Papa. Yeah. What's she saying? Well, that's like the submissive hello squeak, which is. Oh, can you catch it? Yeah. And, um, good girl. It's okay. And um, so she's just saying. Hello, um, but uh, I'm recognising your authority, you know. It's, a, it's an um, arm's length hello. <laughs> exactly, you know, and... Um, you don't... <laughs> is she saying you can't have that? I know, I think her tactic is I'm too frightened to come down and, 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 and get the fruit, um, or in this case, eggplant, so maybe I'll pull you up. Yeah. She wants that fruit. She, she wants does. that eggplant. She does. She does want to come down for it. Yeah, she's still a little bit cautious. Because I'm here, isn't Well, it? yeah, the fact that um, we're all here is, yeah, is, is adding some sort of level of, you know, suspicion, you know, about what's going to happen. So, 
Let's see if we can get Penny to come down at least to the stick. And this is, this is actually very good because we don't want Penny to be wanting to be and feel that she can go close to humans. You want her to be suspicious. Exactly, because you know, the Indonesian rainforest is not empty. So we certainly don't want Penny feeling that she can just walk into a camp. Uh -huh. you know? We want the health suspicion. So here, we'll just get her to take the eggplant. Good girl. Yeah, well she done, Penny. This stage of Cox's program is a delicate balance between contact and non-contact with the orangutans. The team still need to check Penny's health, and one of the trickiest inspections to carry out is the dental check. So what Julius is doing here is trying to feed her, but at the same time, start sneaking some peaks of her teeth. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> She's used to Julius. One of the things with orangutans is you want her to make the move towards you. Does that make sense? So if you go and try oh, and grab her and touch her, there's, there's, there's a natural recall. So the, the trick is when you establish a relationship with an, an animal is to allow her the control to reach out to you. Yeah? And then she'll feel a lot more confident. Here we go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. It's proper life. Yeah. We we'll just, we'll just keep the hand up, and we'll let, allow her to, yeah, slowly. Move. Yeah. Come on, come on. 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 Huh? Mm -hmm. I haven't got the gift. At age 11, Penny is just hitting the orangutan version of puberty, and it's hoped in four or five years' time she adds to the conservation program herself. What we've seen here is um, five births of orangutans actually in this ecosystem. And so, in a sense, and orangutan living wild is one thing, but reproducing and producing offspring in the wild, that's the ultimate goal for conservation. She's had enough of us? Well, that's perfect. You know, she's at the stage now where she's actually an independent orangutan. And so she's come down to say hello and, you know, got a bit of an amusement, you know, and we've got the opportunity to inspect the health condition. But now, as an independent, sentient being, she said, I've had enough, I've got to get on with my day, and, and off she's going. So it's like about, what, 1,000 feet? 700 meters. The question of how best to save the Sumatran orangutans has long been a point of contention. A boycott on products containing palm oil was the focus of one campaign. But Cox argues that even if palm oil production ceases, the forest will still be destroyed for another cash crop. At the Batang Turu Forest on the western side of Sumatra, this claim is clearly evident. Palm oil plants are nowhere to be seen, but rice and rubber is creeping into the forest everywhere. And this forest, at 1,000 metres above sea level, is holding a secret. Cox and colleague Matthew Nowak, a fellow primatologist and PhD student, believe a new species of orangutan could exist here, and only here. They've called it Tapanuli orangutan. Yeah, it's cool. She's beautiful. Yeah. This is Betty. She's a, a young young female. But you know this one? Yeah. Is she Tapanuli? Is she a Tapanuli orangutan? She for sure is a Tapanuli orangutan. She's feeding on some flowers called plecrum. And so right now we're seeing a lot of plecrum in the uh, in the area, and uh, they just seem to gorge themselves with it when it's available. So how are these orangutans, the Tapanui orangutans, different to the others? What are their unique characteristics? Well, this is the one thing that's been a, a bit of a, an enigma, is that they actually look very similar to the ones uh, uh, to the north, very different from the ones in, in Borneo. The ones in Borneo have sort of a, a darker colored skin, uh, darker colored hair. These ones here, uh, very lighter skin color, uh, lighter colored hair, uh, almost sort of like an orangey to a, to a, a golden color. Um, and so it's very, it's very interesting that 
Uh, they look so similar to the ones to the north, however they have uh, um, this uh, genetic structure that is, that is very similar to the ones in Borneo. So uh, it was one of these cryptic um, bits of evidence that we didn't realize until we actually uh, did genetic uh, studies. Until now, it was believed only two species of orangutan existed, the Sumatran and Borneo, named after the two very separate islands on which they are found. How Betty's ancestors came to Sumatra hundreds of thousands of years ago is still unknown. Leif, you were saying mm -hmm. if she looks like mm -hmm. one set, has genetics from another, mm -hmm. because she's heading on a different evolutionary line, mm -hmm. that makes her a new species. Well, yeah, because this population is isolated, it's genetically different, um, and it's in a different environment. Um, it will move in a different direction to the other population. So sooner or later, evolution will dictate that it will be uh, a new species. Whether that's now is, is, you know, is what we're trying to find out through the science. Because of their unique location, cut off from every other orangutan in Sumatra, this population has, in a sense, stayed pure. Now, more than ever, there is simply nowhere else to go. Of this potentially new orangutan species, there are only 400 to 600 left within a forest block of 130,000 hectares. And right here is the epicenter. This is where the majority of them live. It's their last refuge. And Matt and Leif are fighting to protect them from encroaching forces on all sides. Yeah, I'd say you, what you see here, you see pretty much everywhere throughout um, I mean, throughout Sumatra, it's, it's, it's the same syndrome. I mean, every year they make new maps of forest loss and you just see it sort of chipping away and chipping away. It's really quite terrifying, actually. Back at the Orangutan Reserve and Training Centre in central Sumatra, we are on a search for a rather elusive girl called Jackie. Graduating from stage two of training about 12 months earlier, Jackie is now completing the third and final phase of Cox's reintroduction program. Stage three is when we're saying, look, we, we really believe these orangutans now have all the skills and attributes for independent living. Um, but we want to keep checking on that because things can change. And so we put in them the um, radio transmitters, which the battery lasts for years. Um, and then this gives us the ability to go through and track them and the goal is to contact them once a week and just check up on them to see if they're going okay. At last, after well over an hour of searching, we come across some evidence. Two orangutan nests have been found high up in a tree, but Jackie is still hidden. There's an old nest over there. Yeah. Um, you can see it, Julia? Yeah. yeah? I can't see uh, uh, Jackie, but... You can see the nest? It's, yeah. It's a, a Pakis or... Yeah. Oh, yeah. We have uh, two nests uh, over there and in Pakis. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I see that yeah. one. Yeah, yeah. 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 Jackie's inside that nest. Yeah. It's a long way up. What, 30, yes. 40 meters? Yeah, 40 meters, I would have thought. Wow. And then finally, some movement. Ah, there you go. Yep. <laughs> you see her? Yeah, she's feeding up there. That yeah. is so cool. Yeah. Jackie eventually reveals herself, but is not in the slightest bit interested in coming down to say hello. She stays up in the treetops, which of course is exactly what Leif wishes. It always feels good for when you know they they can return independent to the wild. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, a part of you always wants to know exactly where they are at all times, you know, because, you, you know, you are concerned for them as individuals. Um, but, you know, with animals such as Jackie, we, we, we've gained over, over the years that confidence that they will live long and prosperous lives in the jungle. And there's no reason why um, Jackie and the other orangutans we introduce won't do that. Julius has brought us... Yeah. What she's dropped on the ground. Champone, or yeah. is jackfruit. Jackfruit, yeah. Jackfruit, huh? It's a, it's a wild form of jackfruit that um, she's eating up there. You can see Jackie's teeth marks. So she's eating jackfruit. Mm -hmm. 
Is that good? What does that mean? Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, she's, it's one of the many fruits that um, Jackie has learnt to exploit in this forest, which is, you know, why she's doing so well. Um, instead of um, down here with the leeches and the mud, she's up there, um, cool. Just came out of her day nest and now munching into this, so we couldn't ask for more. So how do you feel about it all? Oh, fantastic. This is what the project's about, you know, is um, you know, having orangutans which were either doomed to death or a life in miserable captivity, now living free, independent lives in, in the forest and, and doing well. Yeah, look out. Yeah. Sure beats seeing the orangutan in the zoo, doesn't it? The great hope of the man they call the orangutan whisperer is that one day he never needs to communicate with Jackie again that she no longer needs human help. The great irony, of course, is that Jackie and every other orangutan left on the planet need us more than ever to survive. Their ability to live free in the wild is important. And my goal is to save enough habitat that we're going to have 8,000 orangutans protected in reserves that we're um, looking after. And that will secure the species. And, and that's my goal, and that's at least a decent way to spend one's life.